All right, uh, I think we're live. Hello, everyone. I hope you can hear us well. I hope you're doing well. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be uh, with you today. I'm Thibaut Munier, co-founder of Numbly with Isolis Cost, and it's a, a real pleasure to welcome you all for this webinar, which is part of our MarTech series. Um, MarTech is on fire right now with uh, a lot of key topics and especially two of them, very hot ones that we will be uh, uh, discussing today. Those topics uh, will be probably with us for uh, the whole of 2021. Uh, I'm thinking of cookie-less and clean rooms. Um, so. Uh, we have an amazing audience uh, today with people from all over, really, uh, from uh, the UK, uh, from Belgium, from France, from Sweden, Italy, Spain, Canada, and the US. Uh, so welcome uh, to all of you. Thank you for being with us. And so to uh, discuss these uh, two hot topics uh, today, we will have two uh, fantastic um, experts with us. Um, we will have Alice Stratton, Global Managing Director, LiveRamp Safe Haven. Uh, hello, Alice. Hi there. Thank you for having me. Well, thank you. Um, and we also have Manuel Simarosti, Director of Media, Data Strategy, and Measurement Analytics at Danone US. Hello, Manuel. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for having me. Thank you, uh, both of you, Alice and Manuel. Uh, welcome at Numbly. Thank you immensely for spending some of your so precious time, probably at uh, the worst time of the year, with us. So um, uh, you have both of you fantastic backgrounds. Uh, this is already a key output for uh, today's discussion. I hope we can go and elaborate a little bit uh, beyond this. But to quickly introduce you, Alice, you are a true Aussie uh, from Melbourne. You live in SF. Uh, you have unbelievable long work, uh, working hours. Uh, and you are, uh, to be honest, one of the most energetic person I've ever met. <laughs> uh, you, you decide fast. You act even faster. It took you probably one minute to accept to speak with us today. Needless to say that it's 8 a.m. now for you in SF, so we perfectly understand that uh, you will have to sip your coffee. You are full speed already, and uh, and I hope, um, I don't know if you chose to have cookies or not with your coffee today, but um, in any case, you've been with LiveRAM for six years, I think, this month, and I must say uh, that you are one of the best experts on MarTech these days with a clear focus on your product, uh, your baby, I think, uh, safe haven. So um, we we are very lucky and so thankful to uh, to have you today with us. Thank you, Alice, and be welcome. Oh, thank you so much for the for the introduction. It's absolutely my pleasure to be here with you guys this morning, and yeah, really excited for the discussion. Wonderful. So, Manuel, it's your turn, my friend. Uh, we've met more recently. You are passionate, definitely, about data. Uh, you, you, and, and probably a lot of other topics you might uh, tell us about. You come from Italy, as we can sometimes guess or hear a tiny bit. You studied and worked in Milano. Uh, you worked with L'Oréal, I think, and then Danone, and then you moved to Paris. Uh, you speak an impressive French as well. Uh, you were head of CRM in Paris, I think, for, for Danone for almost four years, which gives you a, a great knowledge of first-party data, which is nowadays in MarTech, obviously, a very critical uh, skill. You then moved to New York, uh, where you live today. Uh, you are, I think, Upper East Side, and I've just heard a couple of uh, some noise from your background sometimes, uh, because I think uh, uh, there is uh, some cleaning in your area today. You are in charge at Danone US of media strategy and data analytics. You've been now with Danone for eight years. Uh, you are passionate, I said that already, and it's just, Manuel, uh, an absolute honor to have you today. Thank you very much, Thibault. It's uh, 
you definitely did your homework <laughs> on checking our background <laughs> here in the USA. It's called the background check. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. No. <laughs> that's the time of background checks. Well, yeah. uh, f feel reassured, it was very short and very quick uh, background checks. Um, so thank you, really, both of you today. So uh, to discuss uh, with you uh, and um, and prepare. Um, our fantastic audience to some of uh, other key issues, probably for next year. Uh, I will have the pleasure to speak with Lucas Kozonis, who is our Monsieur Cookie-less and second party data at Numbly. Hello, Lucas. Lucas, you may be mute, my friend. Hello, everyone. Happy to, to be here today to discuss with you these key topics. Wonderful, thank you, Lucas. So let's just start now. And, and the first thing to say, obviously, part of the reason why we're all here today is because of our good friend, Justin, Justin Shu from uh, Google Chrome, who obviously announced, as you all know, uh, in January, um, that um, what, what really became an earthquake uh, in the data ecosystem, even though it was afterwards, it's always easier to say, kind of predictable. Uh, obviously, uh, I'm thinking of uh, Google's uh, announcement um, about uh, the end of uh, third-party cookies in Chrome. Um, it is going to come uh, very shortly, actually. And um, this is part of the reason why we wanted today to, um, to talk about uh, cookie-less to, to start our conversation. Um, so welcome all of you to this uh, to this cookie-less world. Um, I'm not going to go into details about um, you know this whole evolution that we've all seen too much. Uh, I'm sure you've all attended to too many webinars already, uh, mentioning the different stages, the different moves, both on the legal and technology side regarding cookies. Obviously, it all started with Safari, and, and then uh, uh, we had, obviously, Google Chrome and Firefox, both of them over the years, who gradually uh, shut the door uh, for cookies, and especially, obviously, third-party cookies we're talking about. At the same time, uh, GDPR, uh, obviously, was a major thing uh, in Europe. We then got uh, CCPA in California, and more recently, uh, for those of you who are uh, legal uh, passionate, maybe uh, the French CNIL, uh, Data Regulation Agency, also published some final recommendations regarding consent for the collection of cookies, which are going to be actually in place end of March. So um, this is uh, the, the situation for cookies. And Luca, please tell us a little bit about the different reactions that we see nowadays. Yeah, sure. So uh, in this cookie-less world, which becomes a, a real uh, reality today, there are three types of reactions uh, who appear in the market. The first one tends to limit the granularity of data which is available, so limiting who can access it under a motive of privacy. So Google is a good example, or IAB, with the consent framework. And the main question here is who sets the rule and, and how to mitigate the impact on what you are doing with the data. A second family, which we will deep dive today, is uh, uh, aiming at creating a transition towards a shared interoperable identifier, more persistent and pseudonymized and consent-based. Among the main actors, you can have the trade desk, live ramp, IAB, or others. And key question here is uh, the feasibility of such a solution, and moreover, the adoption to uh, allow a real transition. And a third family of solution aims at doing things differently, move away from people-based marketing to focus on contextual targeting. LiveRamp has been working on such a post-cookie identifier called uh, ATS. So maybe, Alice, you can present to us how this solution works uh, and uh, give more details about it. Yeah, absolutely. Happy to. Um, so how are we building this ecosystem? At the core, and if we 
jump over onto the, the next visual. At the core of our identity infrastructure is the authenticated traffic solution, which establishes scaled identity without third party cookies through a trusted and transparent value exchange. When a consumer authenticates on a publisher's website or a brand's website or a broader owned and operated property. To take a little bit of a closer look at the how, of, how this works, and you can see a little bit of a visual depiction here. LiveRent provides publishers with a free code that is placed on the header of the website. When a user authenticates, the LiveRent API translates PII to an identity link envelope and stores it in a first party cookie context. Upon page load or subsequent page visit, the header bidder reads the identity link envelope from the first party cookie and passes it to the SSP. The SSP passes the identity link envelope to Sidecar to translate uh, to DSP encoded identity link. So that there's different ID states per uh, DSP. Uh, and uh, the bid request on any other information about that inventory. The DSP is then able to make optimally uh, informed bids using onboarded data from LiveRamp and logs the identity link for measurement. So that's a little bit about the technical how, but if we jump over onto the next slide, in short, what this really enables is addressability and better measurement without third party cookies. Um, and on the right-hand side here, you can see a little bit more about the added benefits that come with that. And they're really important to consider. So it also provides individuals with clear uh, notice and choice on how their data is being used. It gives individuals a persistent people-based means of opting out. So rather than needing to opt out of individual publisher domains, uh, it delivers enhanced security around the data for both the brand and the publisher side. And most importantly, in our experience to date, and we can talk a little bit about uh, use cases in a moment, we're actually seeing it performed better than the third party cookie based alternative, which is obviously important for us all here on the line that, that the solution actually works. Sure. Yeah, thank you, Alice. So, so publishers and, and the visitors are, are the starting point to, to create this uh, identity. Um, and so the success of the solution depends on uh, the adoption around this uh, new currency and the standardization, I guess. So could you describe us a, a bit uh, such an ecosystem based on this new currency and uh, how it, uh, it works? Yeah, so LiveRamp's really committed to remaining open and neutral and promoting a competitive ecosystem. So this is very much in line with what the LiveRamp story has always been about being this neutral and agnostic connector of data. And we purposefully designed the authenticated traffic solution uh, to essentially be addressability infrastructure that is capable of supporting multiple identifiers in a very neutral and interoperable way. Uh, so again, very much remaining in line with what LiveRamp's philosophy has always been around helping our, our customers and our partners connect data with their preferred technology and, and their preferred partners. Uh, so through this, we're really help focused on helping our publisher partners make their inventory targetable and measurable uh, without cookies or, or other device identifiers. And we're also really committed to enabling brands to run better campaigns on every dimension, whether that be reach, uh, return on ad spend, cost per page view, uh, and increased order value, just to, just to name a few examples. So the ecosystem that we see is is one that's interoperable and uh, neutral. Thank you, Alice. And uh, yes, I think um, you've had some uh, some great news uh, at, at LiveRamp recently with uh, the Trade Desk, Nielsen, uh, Credeo uh, joining uh, your um, post cookie um, uh, standard, you could say. And I think it's it's great news for for everyone to see that it's just not one company system, but that there is a, a true uh, uh, connection of several um, 
identifiers, and um, that is probably um, a, a critical step, I think, for, for everyone uh, on this market, considering that, as uh, Luca said before, there are, and there will be, obviously, additional and alternatives. Um, so one, one question, Alice, I wanted to ask, I think, is, is um, do you have already uh, some case studies leveraging IDL? Yeah, we do. And I, I think as these announcements were being made and, and marketers and advertisers were preparing for the future, uh, a lot of the mindset was around how do we minimize the disruption of this change? How do we fill the gap um, that will be made by third party cookie deprecation? But the good news in that is, and the thing that we're really excited about is that uh, early indications show that the, the cookie-less alternative actually performs better. And uh, you can see here a, a case study from a, a, a recent uh, campaign with Fitbit where we actually saw that the, the cookie-less uh, ATS-driven campaign actually uh, delivered a, a 2x uh, return on ad spend uh, improvement over the cookie-based alternative. So. Lots more on this to come, um, but we're really excited by what we're seeing so far. And, and it's, it's very encouraging to see that not only is there a path forward uh, through this kind of change in the status quo, but it's actually performing better uh, than, than what has been happening historically. Yeah, I think it's a very encouraging case and we're very excited at Numberly to prepare a, a first uh, IDL testing with, uh, with LiveRamp uh, in Europe. Um, so, uh, Manuel, now your turn, my friend. What, what's your vision about uh, unique identifiers such as the IDL? So, uh, thank you for asking, obviously. Uh, I think that IDL, first of all, we decided as Danone USA to uh, leverage uh, this opportunity and using IDL. And I think that uh, the main reason why uh, we decided to do so is related to uh, a strategic vision of having a holistic data view. I think that there are two fundamental elements. The first of all is uh, um, for building our audiences, we heavily rely on third party data and we know then when matching different data sources, uh, we generally see a gap or a drop rate between matching deterministically all those data. And also we see generally a drop rate when we match those audiences with the, the DSPs. Um, what we have found is that, is that uh, the IDL really enable us uh, to connect uh, with uh, one silver lining between uh, all our um, audiences and connecting together with one single currency our uh, uh, audiences and at the same time uh, when we push them into the DSPs. So we have seen uh, um, so far success on this uh, related to third-party data. I think that the other big uh, uh, use case that we have seen uh, um, favorable for us is related to first-party data. By definition our business model is not heavy on CRM or traditional CRM data, but we still have access to some of them and IDL enable us to do exclusion, retargeting and lookalike modeling. And I think that one use case that I think, uh, I'm not sure we're gonna touch base during this conversation, but I think for us, um, Danone US is very powerful, is uh, the live run pixel because once implemented in our website, it basically gives us an IDL of all the people visiting our website. And therefore for us is a very powerful tool to even further enhance our holistic data view because it connects our media with the website visits and the CRM piece of it in one unique identifier that for us is certainly uh, very powerful. Thank you, Manuele. Um, yeah, it's very interesting. You talked about currency and, um, and, and that's actually uh, critical when it comes to um, building collaboration between different partners. So this is really the second section we, we wanted to, to have uh, during this discussion today. Um, maybe, Luca, you can tell us a little bit more about what we see as far as data collaboration on the market. 
Yeah. Um, yeah. So very, uh, very briefly, what, what we see in this change of paradigm on, on, the, on the digital ecosystem is that brands are challenged in their data sovereignty and uh, they need to uh, re, re see the, the way they approach uh, their data, uh, especially towards big platform and leader of all industries. And you can see some examples here that are public are striking some partnerships uh, to try to hybridize their model and to, thanks to data collaboration, to better know and serve the customers. But to do that in an efficient way, we need to see a little bit uh, inside uh, uh, the box, how it happens. And behind the scene of this data partnership, there is a critical subject of second party data. So uh, second party data, it's the history of a uh, way to uh, under exploited potential. But today uh, we are really seeing uh, that it's, it's changing now with an inevitable shift from third party to second party. So in this context, of course, first party data is even more critical to build the brand's own property and an asset uh, for partnerships. Third party data in this cookie less environment is a crumbling and a, a difficult bet today. And so second party data appears like a refuge. And in order to amplify the first party data potential uh, you have, you must find a way to, to tackle the challenges of second party data. And second party data challenges are, are big and are around standardization and industrialization. That's why it's so much connected to this currency uh, topic of the, the first section. And, um, and to, to tackle this, uh, a new theoretical uh, concept is born, uh, which we call clean rooms. There are a lot of uh, interpretation of, uh, of this concept. We will see uh, that after, but the, the initial concept, it's uh, an enclosed secured environment where different stakeholders can share a part of their data while defining which level of access is given to whom for which usage, and therefore everyone can remain in control of, of this. So each partner, uh, a brand, a retailer, or other type of friend, partner can bring a part of the CRM or the CDP data, for example, to match it against in this secure place and with a people-based vision. And at the center of it, connectivity to enable uh, activation and, and creation of value. And it's very important to, to highlight that this, this is really control-based and so uh, a privacy is at the center of, of, of it. It's by design and, um, and so uh, all the consent can be managed in, in such a, a technology. So there is not one generic um, uh, framework. It's uh, uh, still evolving, but there are some key ingredients. And for sure, what, what you have to know, it's at the center of it, there is a trust that is enabled both by technology, but also by the, the role, and, and we'll see that after, of a, of a middleman that can uh, enable uh, and, and make sure that there is uh, uh, some neutrality uh, when you mix two types of data. Um, so that's, that's really key. And, uh, and Thibault, um, these clean rooms are still in their infancy, but we can see already that there are different perceptions on the market, and maybe you can... Uh, uh, yeah. Comment Ab this. Absolutely. As always, we have the original definition, I think that you explained pretty well, and, and David Smith in Ad Exchanger uh, made it very clear as well. He said, um, it's a shared environment secured with external access between two or more enterprises, which is better if you want to have a partnership, obviously, where each enterprise can determine the level of visibility of its data. That is the true definition. And this is a gifted child clean rooms uh, in the MarTech space. But um, uh, now comes as always the wall garden version. And what, uh, how does Seb Joseph in DigiDay explain that wall garden version? He says, clean rooms are places where walled gardens like Google, Facebook, and Amazon share aggregated rather than customer level data with advertisers while still exerting strict controls. 
So that's a quite different definition. And we don't want, obviously, no one on the market uh, want this clean room uh, gifted child become, obviously, a spoiled child. So Alice, uh, we have a key burning question for you here. Is safe haven a clean room after all? <laughs> yeah, good question. Uh, so it really does depend on the definition that you subscribe to. And this is a question that I get asked a lot from marketers who are thinking about it through the lens of the walled garden definition and trying to understand how safe haven may be similar or different to what they've seen from, from some of those partners to date. And when viewed through that lens, I would say that that safe haven is different. Um, if we look at the interpretation of clean rooms um, as they've been illustrated by wall gardens today, it's really been about uh, providing data insights or a measurement uh, environment at the segment level and typically attached to their own uh, media inventory. And uh, safe haven, uh, while similar in that it does provide a very kind of secure and controlled environment where LiveRamp can provide the, the permission and the access control layers uh, between two parties or perhaps even between two teams internally uh, for some of our customers. Uh, we go further than uh, that wall garden definition in that we can also provide uh, more granular or record level access to data, so not just uh, the segment level. Uh, it also supports collaboration uh, between a brand or between parties at a brand. And another kind of key differentiator is the ability to uh, make work that is done within the environment actionable. And so you can see here in, in this view, uh, whether it be creating reports that can be exported from an analytics environment or audiences that can then provided that the right data permissions are in place, uh, be used for activation in the ecosystem, not just across uh, one channel, but across LiveRamp's ecosystem of, of 500 plus partners, um, <clears throat> I think is a key difference from that, that wall garden definition. But if we go back to the original of uh, being a, a kind of safe and controlled space where, where parties can collaborate, that definition fits. But what we've seen is that as this is such a new and such an emerging and, and still somewhat nascent category, uh, a lot of the, the advertisers that I'm in conversations with are, are starting to see the clean room as defined by the wall gardens. Interesting. Thank you very much, Alice. Um, Luca, maybe you want to elaborate a little bit on the... Uh... Different yeah, no, I completely, uh, completely agree on uh, on this uh, this uh, difference and and um, uh, presentation of uh, your platform for data collaboration. Uh, so, safe heaven. Uh, yeah, it's very interesting to uh, to see where what what is possible with this the, the clean room uh, to define if it's a clean room uh, uh, to its full power or uh, some uh, part of uh, what could be a clean room. So. The way we see it uh, to is to to unleash the the, the full potential of of what uh, can be done between a brand and a partner. Uh, a clean room must uh, allow to uh, to activate three type of uh, use cases. Uh, some around targeting and insights, leveraging the whole intersection of the two data sets of the brand and its partner. The the ability to uh, to omni-channel activation, precision marketing based on, on this data and uh, in real time, of course, and be able to do measurement, uh, crunching uh, a granular data uh, and different data sets uh, in this safe environment to, uh, to be a real clean room and not only a, a, a publisher ecosystem, which is uh, um, restricted to, to its walls. So I, I think this will be a big challenge for, for brands is to, to be able to build uh, those ecosystems where they can make uh, the data move to, uh, to have uh, the full potential of the, the capacity. And so uh, in, 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 this, uh, and in this context, I, I think it's, it's interesting to understand if the data collaboration can be a, a real answer 
or not to, to a fragmented world we see uh, with these different uh, ecosystems. So maybe you can uh, um, explain what uh, what you see there and how you collaborate with uh, with the brands to uh, to help them navigate in, in this ecosystem, Alice. Yeah, absolutely. And so again, if we if we take a look at the line of sight that the wall gardens like an Amazon can have uh, into their end to end customer journey. So everything from browse behavior and those different kind of purchase uh, intent signals right through to the conversion event itself. Uh, th the wall gardens have this this data advantage of having that that clear end to end line of sight. Whereas uh, for many brands, they may be able to capture certain aspects of the customer journey, but not others. And, and perhaps some of those other kind of key moments, uh, maybe data points that their, their close partners capture, uh, but without having a safe and controlled means of bringing it together, you end up with this kind of broken line of sight uh, when you compare it to, to what is possible within a, a walled garden. And if we are to kind of double click maybe into, into Amazon as an example, and you can see here that through the combination of the, the persistent sense of identity that, that Amazon has through the different authentication touch points, as well as just a continuous stream of data, um, this has really enabled them to, to bring together a, a view that can power a really great uh, customer experience engine as well as a, a pretty successful media business at this point. And if we kind of think about this framework and then think about the, the potential for brands to essentially be able to bring together their own sphere of influence and those trusted partners that they work with, that they share a customer journey with, uh, there is that potential to bring together those data points, even if they're not all kind of uh, owned by the brand to similarly create their own uh, kind of data network. And uh, we have a, an example here, kind of again, building upon that Amazon framework, where whether, and this is just a, a retailer example, so whether it be bringing together their, their CPG partners or, or other suppliers, or perhaps even their uh, close publisher partners, uh, whether that be the digital or, or TV, um, just being able to bring together all of those consumer touch points. And again, using the persistent sense of identity that the identity link can bring to the table, uh, as well as a continuous stream of data uh, from these different points in the customer journey, you can similarly create that end-to-end -end line of sight that can power a, a really strong customer experience engine, uh, as well as a number of different use cases, whether they be uh, performance oriented or for some customers, revenue generated, generating oriented. Yeah, thank you, Alice. And, and one point we wanted to touch on as well when talking about uh, um, data collaboration is the critical role, we believe, um, of trusted third parties. Um, obviously, when we uh, partner uh, uh, with you, LiveRamp, we're, we're um, very glad to, to bring, um, as normally, a service expertise a, uh, um, of, of a trusted third party because we see so much that, let's say, between a brand and a retailer, and we'll see uh, examples right after, uh, this is so critical. Um, this is critical because, as Luca, you explained perfectly well, um, in safe haven, be it a clean room or not, um, <laughs> when um, a brand and a partner want to share data, uh, you need to have someone to actually organize, orchestrate the conversation between the two partners. It can generate insights, it can generate activation, but very often, obviously, um, each partner doesn't want the other part to see the types of data that um, they have put in the, in the uh, safe haven or in the clean room environment. So this is very often our role, uh, normally, to actually make it work and elaborate on your fantastic uh, technology. Um, Manuel, 
Could you tell us a little bit about your journey, Danon US journey with Safe Haven? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think that our journey started a little bit more than a year ago and where we really started to uh, put pen to paper and define our, uh, I would say, data strategy and roadmap. Uh, and I think that uh, what we found very powerful is combining, obviously, identity link with Safe Haven. And as of now, uh, we are basically already using Safe Haven uh, in um, a specific, I would say, use case that is what I call the DMP-like uh, use case, because really what we're using now, Safe Haven, um, is really for us to do three things. Uh, Safe Haven is connected to LiveRAM Connect, that is the data store, where basically we can buy all the data for our uh, for building our audiences and then we bring those data into safe haven and we build our audiences and then we push them to the different dsps and then uh, we are able um, safe haven has also a piece of it that is called insights that is that basically enables us to have uh, uh, very powerful obviously insights uh, on our audiences and I think that another piece that for us is also very important is related to the fact that how much Safe Haven can help us to get, I would say, uh, ahead of the curve for everything related to addressability and gathering more and more data back um, in our platform uh, to get more and more uh, visibility and intel on how our campaign are performing. And I think that uh, the other part that for me, it, I, um, it's a given, but it's super important, um, is uh, that Safe Haven is a safe, uh, privacy compliant, uh, I would say, platform uh, where we don't have to worry about anything of that uh, because we know that uh, LiveRamp is taking care of it and everything that uh, we do and operate within the platform, uh, it's safe by definition uh, uh, related to the consumer and the data that we're managing, that is obviously our first priority before doing any of um, our strategy. Wonderful. Thank you, Manuel, very much. And we wanted to now give you some actual case studies because data collaboration is nice, uh, theory is, is perfect, but we want to see cases. We want to see how brands and their retailers and their partners actually can make it work. And um, so one case we wanted to present you all today was the Activia from Danone France case. Actually, um, Danone had a couple of needs. They wanted to measure the sales of a uh, digital media campaign uh, to track an individual's path to purchase, to obviously optimize audience targeting based on real retailer sales data. And so um, that was the uh, general context. So um, we um, actually designed a campaign leveraging a LiveRamp Safe Haven platform that um, uh, it was um, uh, a retailer, large global retailer uh, safe haven platform where that retailer actually put um, all of their data um, so that brands could cooperate with them. And so the case um, I will present you now is the case of a collaboration between uh, Danone and that retailer on the safe haven solution with Numberly playing the role of a trusted third party partner. So uh, it's a very interesting case with uh, segmentation first and then activation and finally true uh, incremental measurement. Uh, so the way it worked is really this um, safe haven uh, that is operated by Numberly, where that retailer actually put all of their data. We're talking large volumes here of sales, uh, over 20 billion euros uh, for one year of sales data at the individual level, all collected obviously through loyalty cards, which gives a fantastic database of uh, um, offline and online, obviously, purchases. Uh, and then Danone came in and said, well, uh, as Manuel, you said before, I have my CRM file, I have my data, I want to leverage it. So um, you guys put some of your CRM data into 
that safe haven, we normally, as a trusted third party, uh, we made the match. We came up with very valuable insights and we designed a campaign with six clusters of clients and prospects, all created from the retailer purchasing data. And we started the activation. So, which means we leveraged uh, uh, LiveRAM's features to actually uh, activate, display Video360 and, and Facebook, obviously, with uh, uh, six uh, different and customized messages. Um, and we measured, closing the loop, uh, we measured the full impact of that activation on a segment basis. So, just to give you an idea of how it looked, we're talking here about uh, fantastic uh, dairy products. Um, I'm sure Manuel could tell us a lot about them. Um, so we had uh, different types of creatives, obviously, um, with these uh, Activia products. And so the first thing we did in the data was to actually identify the people we wanted to target. So we came up with six clusters of 1.7 million uniques. Uh, so pretty much one sixth of that total retailers database. And these people that we actually exposed to the campaigns happened to represent 34% uh, of the buyers, total buyers of Activia during uh, that campaign. So more than a third of all buyers were people we had um, included into uh, our setting, into our experimental design. This is critical. And those people actually represented almost 50%, actually 44% of the total sales of that brand in, in this retailer, at this retailer, during the full time of the campaign. So the first thing to say is it is now possible to predict and to uh, who is likely to buy. And that is, that is very key because if you want to, impl to influence the purchase behavior, you'd rather be able to guess who is actually going to buy. And here are the results. So you have a fantastic uh, incremental sales here with um, almost 8% overall conversion rate, so test versus control, plus 22% incremental rate of visitors on the website, so huge impact, plus 17% on the e-commerce conversion rate and overall sales for the brand during that period of plus 25%. So we're talking here real incrementality. And that actually got a fantastic award just two weeks ago. Congratulations to uh, Danone and to LiveRamp and maybe to Numberly Teams as well, because that's uh, a major ICOM um, global award, data creativity award. So, Manuel, you were in New York. You had time to think about that campaign. What do you think? What's your vision on this? So, in general, I think that uh, second, what you did, obviously, it's super inspiring and it's, for me is really the future. I think that uh, second party data and retailer data for me are the future and are the kind of data with the most untapped potential uh, because they are just, uh, say, we focus first on third and then in first and then second, uh, is, it's literally on their infancy. I think that, um, so retailer data for me is really the future. I think that I'm, uh, I'm very jealous of what you managed to do in Europe because uh, I, I, I would love, I dream of doing something like this in the USA. I think that um, we are in active talks, obviously, with LiveRamp uh, in order to find um, a retailer here in the USA eager to uh, launch this kind of tests. We didn't manage to find it yet, but I think that it's just for me, just a matter of uh, setting up the right time, the right conversation and the right roadmap, because I think that uh, it's, 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 it's in our stars. We just need to make it happen. And it's just about creating the right condition to set up this kind of test. But congratulations. I think that is very interesting. Thank you, Manuel, and don't be jealous. I'm sure we can work on something with you and Alice <laughs> in the US, really. So uh, before opening up to the, the number of questions uh, that we have, I wanted to share the, with you just three things we've learned after over 30 use cases on Safe Haven with Brand Retailer Corporation. First thing is at scale experimentation works. 
please read or reread uh, Stephen Thomke book uh, published this year, I think, uh, just before lockdown. Uh, it's a fantastic book to read during <laughs> lockdown. Um, it's great. Uh, experimentation work, the surprising power of business experiments. This is what we do. This is what we did with you. There was a test, there was a control. We could control both. Um, there was, that was uh, really interesting. Second thing, uh, we could measure incremental sales. And, and obviously, the very important thing, the value of always on. We start seeing that um, it is not about one-shot campaigns. Uh, we're talking here about uh, longer term campaigns. If you want to impact things, if you want to maximize your ROI, look, it's not going to happen overnight. I mean, uh, we're talking shoppers, real buyers here, real people. They have their life. And if you want to influence their behavior, it takes some time. So uh, what we see here is longer and longer campaigns. And I think that's a very positive sign that we see on the market. Second thing is measuring and impacting CLV for a brand. This actually works. Uh, you could think that, well, CLV is only for, you know, companies that have their own e-com and transactional database. This is not true. Obviously, you have some heavy buyers. Here you see one of the top brand I, I, can't, I can't mention, but but who cares? Uh, we did the CLV for them, which means we computed with Safe Haven all the transactions from all their brands uh, in that given retailer's environment. And we came up with three CLV segments, the heavy buyers over 99 euros per year. This is huge when you're a CPG medium buyers, light buyers. Based on that, you can do everything. You can do migration matrix. You can do relationship marketing when you're a, C, uh, a CPG. This is, this is fantastic. This will change, I believe, the way CPGs do marketing because really that was the starting point. Not all, cre all customers were created equal. You remember uh, Don Pepper's Martha Rogers. Well, this is coming to CPG at last after 30 years. And last but not least, brand CRM programs have a huge opportunity in measuring their incremental impact on sales. And they can do that by matching their file with Safe Haven. We've done that a dozen times. It works. It's very powerful for the CRM program because suddenly they can measure their true impact as a brand uh, CRM program. They can you know, fine tune and guess and identify which works, which doesn't work. That's a great use case. So now I'm done with speaking. Please let's open it up for questions. Lucas, what kind of question are, are, are we having, if any? There is a, a first question maybe uh, on, a, on a recent uh, Apple uh, announcement uh, for uh, maybe for LiveRamp uh, on their technology. So can, can you touch on the iOS 14 Apple data privacy change coming up in uh, Q1? Uh, and so how is LiveRamp and Danon approaching it? I don't know if you want to uh, add this, this question on the uh, uh, Apple uh, announcement. Yeah, so in general, uh, the one of the, the key things about the authenticated traffic solution is that it, it moves us to a place of consented addressability. Um, so I, I'm probably not the best person to speak to the specifics of the 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 privacy implications of that particular announcement um but uh across the board with the authenticated traffic solution we really see that because we're moving to a place of of focus on consent and, and focus on authentication that many of uh the changes that we've seen from providers like like apple with with the changes to safari and whatnot is that uh we've been able to support addressability in those spaces because we're moving towards consent and, and authentication, which is like one of the underlying trends in those changes. So uh, more on that to come from, from LiveRamp, or LiveRamp around that particular change, uh, but that's broadly how we, we're thinking about the trends that we're seeing uh, evolve in those spaces. Sure. Uh, we then have another one. What permission does a customer need to give in, uh, in, in order, sorry, for a company to be allowed to use 
uh, that customer data in a safe haven. In other words, is there a specific permission that the customer needs to, to give? Yeah, so th there's probably not a one size fits all answer on this. Um, it really kind of comes down to your your privacy policy. But the the general kind of, again, theme and trend that we're seeing here is a move towards uh, transparency and towards very clear kind of uh, understandable notice and choice moments for the consumer. I think in the past, um, you know, the average person may not have understood where and how their data is being used. And uh, moving forward, consumers are expecting uh, more transparency. And, and that's really what we've seen. Uh, that's really what we've seen the kind of changing regulation rally around as well. So I wouldn't say that there is a, a, a specific language set that's required. Um, it, it does come down to what is the data you're capturing. But in general, uh, what we're seeing is just like a move towards more transparency um, and more kind of, uh, you know, layman's terms or even like the average person could understand and, and see where and how their data is being captured and is intended to be used. So uh, what, what that kind of leads to, uh, and, and something that I think is, is a really healthy thing for our industry to be thinking about and working towards is how can we, do, how can we deliver ongoing value to a consumer so that they're going to continually provide um, the ability for you to engage with them in marketing activities? Oh, yeah. It, it's no longer a given. You have to be providing that value for a consumer to continue to give their consent for you to engage with them. Oh, definitely. Manuel, do you see also value exchange uh, as a uh, key topic for 2021? Certainly, I think that there's, uh, as mentioned, I think that uh, the first party data piece of our strategy is still limited. But regardless of the size, I think that uh, making sure to have a clear contract with our consumers, uh, regardless, uh, we say, of the context, uh, is fundamental you know to make sure that uh, they are properly informed and so we we have all the privacy requirement uh, to leverage those data but i think that the visibility and transparency is the theme for 2021 and going forward yes yeah, so we have another question can i exploit the audiences i generate uh, to do crm campaigns uh, in safe haven um, I guess you, you had this already, uh, Alice. How would you answer that question? Uh, so if, if I'm understanding the, que the question correctly around, can I use audiences that I've created within Safe Haven? So let's just say you brought a few data assets into the analytics environment and you've used it cre to create a new profile. Um, uh, the answer is yes, provided that the right permissions are in place um, from the data owner to enable that. So, so what I mean by that is uh, one of the key values of Safe Haven is that we enable data owners to control where and how their data can be used. And sometimes that means that they may only be comfortable with that data being used for uh, analytics purposes only. So they don't want the data to ever leave Safe Haven. They're happy for their partners to to run analytics, run some measurement, but they don't want it to be used for activation. And, and that's something that uh, the Safe Haven platform can control for. So Wonderful. yeah, I guess my answer is you can use it for audiences provided that there's agreement and the right permissions are in place for it. Great. Um... We have one question also about the Activia case done within Facebook. Was the media used in Activia case um, done within Facebook? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Some of the media, as I said, was being done within Facebook. Uh, can you tell which people got truly exposed? Hmm, nice question. Or you just uh, know the test audience uploaded. So the answer is here. 
we really looked at outcome-based type of measurement. So we didn't know in that case uh, who was uh, truly exposed. We just knew the uploaded ones. And still, we had this impressive uplift I presented earlier. But if the question is, uh, would I like to have the exposure data? Oh, yes, absolutely. And I think Manuel would love it as well. And Alice would love to provide that. But we need to have pretty nice conversation with Facebook. Um, Alice, I must say we have a few uh, number of questions uh, because uh, about, about um, the global coverage of Safe Haven. <laughs> because we have um, people from everywhere. So someone is asking uh, whether you are implanted in Canada. Uh, we have someone else who says, I'm a, a global brand with footprint in China, APAC, US, EU. I wonder what's your tool roadmap? Yeah, great question and a great question to get. Um, so the general rule of thumb is that Safe Haven is available wherever LiveRamp is. And uh, one of the really exciting things about uh, the authenticator traffic solution is that's really accelerating our, our global footprint and our, our global availability as we're no longer uh, reliant on building cookie-based networks in order to enable matching in new, net, in new markets. Um, we're able to really accelerate our capabilities there. So, uh, the the scale of the authenticator traffic solution is that you know we're working with 45 plus of the the major dsps 25 of the the major ssps uh, 160 uh, plus publishers and and these are global providers so uh the the markets where we're we're currently active and i'm gonna get in so much trouble if i forget someone off the cuff uh but the the us uk uh, France, uh, multiple regions in, in APAC, including China, Japan, Australia. Uh, we're, we're just getting up and running across Spain and Italy, uh, Germany. So uh, there's, there's a lot happening on the global front, but that's also accelerating thanks in, in some part due to the authenticated traffic solution and, and the, the the momentum we're seeing around adoption there great um also a question um for business with omni-channel platform how can safe haven add value without the need to replace existing data audience segmentation tools do you guys want to replace everything alice <laughs> Yeah, again, great question. Um, and again, this kind of comes back to, to LiveRamp's general philosophy where we are more about complementing and enhancing your existing investments than trying to displace them. Um, so if you have in-house tooling uh, that you're happy with and is working or you've got an existing partner, uh, LiveRamp can, can typically connect those to safe haven capabilities so that you can enhance and amplify where you've already made investments uh, versus needing to think about it as a as a, a rip and replace type situation. Uh, so again, without knowing the specifics of the the tech stack that you're that you're weighing up behind this question, uh, I mm -hmm. would say in general, uh, we our general philosophy is to be complementary and to enhance uh, what you're already doing. Um, there's, there's definitely scenarios where customers come to LiveRamp uh, wanting to use us as their their audience capability or their analytics capability, and and that's also okay. We we do provide uh, you know really robust product features in those spaces, uh, but that's not to say that we can't live alongside existing capabilities. Mm -hmm. Manuel, did you have to trash everything you had at Danone US? No, we didn't. I think <laughs> we were, I think it was very, say, I'm touching wood, as they say here. It has been a very smooth integration and the live round team has been great. So, so far, so good. Wonderful. Um, yeah, and, and Luca, maybe you wanted to elaborate on this question. Yeah, I think uh, it's also um, um, 
the responsibility of uh, the the agency working with the, the brand and what that's what we do a lot it's to uh, tailor uh, how to leverage these uh, capac capabilities based on what is already existing of course you don't have to replace everything but you have to analyze what is your asset where you want to activate it can be with a crm tool do you have the opt-ins for that and then then how you uh, prioritize your the partners you work with and, and how you leverage the technological solutions to 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 make that uh, work well thank you so much uh i'm afraid we're we're unfortunately running out of time we have so many questions guys it was great thank you so much both of you could you to finish maybe give us your uh, keyword for 2021 manuel what what would you say what is going to be the hottest topic next year uh, second party data. What about you, Alice? That's a that's a tough one. Um, I I want to say customer experience, and I know that's a little. It may sound a little bit cliche, but I think we have to deliver meaningful customer experiences um, in order to have that ongoing uh, consent and and value exchange working well. Awesome, Luca. What's yours? Collaboration. Oh. You're a little bit cliche, my friend. Um, I want to see case studies. I want to see real things. I mean, I think uh, this is great. And I love our discussion today. Now I hope that uh, we can have uh, great, uh, great cases uh, uh, this year and um, next year, obviously. And I want to thank you all for being uh, so numerous to follow us. And, and uh, great thanks, obviously, to, uh, to our uh, speakers. Uh, thank you so much, Alice. You, uh, you did an unbelievable job. Good luck for the end of the year. And Manuel, thank you again so much for, for being with us today. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Yeah, that was fun. Thank you so much. Thank you, both of you. Thank you, Luca. And uh, goodbye, everyone. Our next webinar uh, is going to be a marketing reboot uh, about customer engagement. So we're talking research here. And if you're interested, please register. Everyone is talking about customer engagement. But what about research? What does research tell us about that? So we'll have Greg and Lucy May uh, from uh, Numberly to uh, elaborate on this. And this is going to be December 16th. Uh, thank you all. Thank you, everyone. I, I wish you a great day. And please send us your, our, your questions. We'll forward them to our great speakers. See you all. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you.